Tomorrow Theatre presents And No Bird Sings The red trimming of the house for which I was bound was visible from just outside the station at which I had lighted so the sheriff had told me the distance was no more than a mile's walk I took the path across the fields it ran straight till it came to the edge of the wood yonder which beyond to my host above which his chimneys were visible I could, should find a gate to the toiling of the wood, a track traversing it, which he bulged close to his higher garden. So, in this adorable afternoon of early May, it seemed a waste of time to do no other than walk through the meadows and woods and set off on foot while the motor carried my traps. It was one of those golden days which every now and again leak out of paradise and drip to earth. Spring had been late in the morning in coming, and now it was here with a burst, and the whole world was boiling with sap of life. Never have I seen such a wealth of spring flowers, or such vividness of green, or heard such middleless business among the birds of hedgerows. His walk through the meadows was a jubilee, a festival for efficacy, and best of all, so I promised myself, would be the passage through the wood, newly fledged, with milky green, a lane just ahead. There was the gate just facing me. I passed through it into the dappled lights and shadows of the grass grown track. Coming out of brilliant sunshine, just like entering a dim tunnel. One has a sense of being suddenly withdrawn from the brightness of the spring into some subquidrous cavern. Tree tops formed a green roof overhead, excluding light to a remarkable degree. I moved in a world of shifting obscurity. Presently, the, guy, uh, the trees grew more scattered, and place was taken by a thick growth of hazels, which met over over the path, and then the garden sloping backwards, downwards. I came upon an open clearing, covered with bracken and heather, and studded with breeches. By now, though, I walked once more beneath the luminous sky, with the sunlight pouring down. It seemed to have lost its effluence. The brightest was it so odd, illusional, an uh, optical illusion, was veiled as it came through creep. And there was the sun, still well above the treetops, in an unclouded heaven. But all the light was that of a stormy winter's day, throughout mournful brilliance. It's at least silent, too. I thought that the bushes and trees would be ringing with solemn birds. But listening, I could hear no more of any sort, either the fluttering of a thrush or a blackbird, nor the cheerful whirl of a jack finch, the cooing wood pigeon, nor the strident clamour of the jay. I paused to verify this odd silence. No doubt about it. It was either rather eerie. Rather uncanny, but I suppose the birds knew their own business best. If they were too busy to sing, it was their affair. As I went on, it struck me also that since entering the woods, I had not seen a bird of any kind, and now I so crossed the clearing, I had kept my eyes alert for them, but fruitlessly, and soon entered the further belt of thick trees which surrounded it. Some of them... Most of them, I noticed, were beeches growing very close to each other. The ground beneath them was bare, but a carpet of fallen leaves and few thin and bramble bushes. In this curious dimness and thickness of trees, it's impossible to see how far to the right or left of the path and how, for the first time since I left the open, I found some sort of life. There came the rustle of leaves from not far away. I thought to myself that a rabbit anyhow was moving but something it lacked somehow it lacked the scratchy old patter the small animal there was a certain stealthy heaviness about it it's something much larger they're stealing along the dirious or not being heard i passed again to see what might emerge but instantly the sound ceased Simultaneously, I was conscious of some faint but very foul odour reaching me and choking the corrupt, yet somehow pungent, more like the odour of something rather al alive rather than rotting. It was peculiarly sickening. 
and not wanting to get any closer to its source, I went on my way. Before long, I came to the edge of the wood. Straight in front of me was a strip of meadowland. Beyond an iron gate, between the two brick walls, through which I had a glimpse of a lawn of lower beds. To the left stood a house, and over the house, the garden would pour the amazing brightness of the plain afternoon. Hugh Granger had and his wife were sitting on the lawn with a huge pack of salty dogs, a Welsh collie, a yellow retriever, a fox terrier, a Pekingese. The process and my children gave way to the welcome of recognition. I was admitted into the circle. There was much to say, for I had been out of England for some last three months, during which Hugh had settled in a little... It is a little estate left to him by a close uncle. He and Daisy had been busy during an Easter vacation. We were getting into the house. Certainly it was a most attractive legacy. A house, though, which I presently taken, was a delightful little Queen Anne manor. Its situation on the edge of its forever clad farm, sorry, which quite superb. We had a tea in a small panel parlour, overlooking the garden, and soon a wild of topics narrowed down to those of the day, the hour. I walked. Had I asked Daisy from the station, did I go through the wood, or follow the path outside it? The question she thus put to me was given trivially enough. There was no hint in her voice uh, what it mattered to score to her which way I had to come, but it was quite certainly clearly born in, a, in upon me that not only that she but Hugh also listened attentively to my reply. He just lit a cigarette, a match for a cigarette, then held it on reply till he heard my answer. Yet I go through the wood. But now, though I had received some odd impression of wood, it seemed quite ridiculous to mention that there were. I could not suddenly say the sunshine there was a whole very poor quality. There was at one point in my traverse I smelled a most incredulous odour. I'd walked through the wood. That was all I had to tell them. I had known both my host and hostess for a tale of many years, and now, which I felt was nothing except purely fanciful stuff, like a volunteer about my experience there, I noticed that they exchanged a swift glance and come readily and could easily interpret it. Each of them signaled to another to express a relief, and told each other that also I could strew their glance, and I, at any rate, had found nothing unpleasant unusual to wood. They pleased at that, and when before any pause had succeeded to my answer, I had gone through the wood. I remembered that strange absence of bird song of birds, as that seemed an uncontrous observation in national history. I thought I might as well mention it. One odd thing struck me, I began, and as he saw the attention of both riveted again, I didn't see a single bird or hear one from the time I entered the wood to when I left it. Hugh lit his cigarette. I noticed that too, he said. It's rather puzzling. The wood is certainly a bit of primal forest, and one could have thought the host of birds were nested in it from time immemorial. But like you, I've heard it. Never seen, heard, or seen one in it. I've never seen even a rabbit there either. I thought I heard one this afternoon, said I. Somebody was moving to fall on the leaves. Did you see it? he asked. My recollection that it decided the noise is not quite the pattern of a rabbit. No, I didn't see it, I said. And perhaps it wasn't one. It sounded rather like more, something much larger. Once again, a mistakenly glance passed between you, his wife, and she rose. I'm going to off, off, she said. Post out at seven. I leave all morning. What are you two going to do? Something out of doors, please, said I. I want to see the domain. You and I coldly strolled out again. A cohort of dogs. The main was certainly very charming. 
small lady lay beyond the garden, with a reed bed vocal with warblers, a tough wood margin with coots and ball hens scuttered at our approach, rising from the end of it. Of that was a huge, high, heavy knoll full of rabbit holes, which the dogs nosed at joyful expectations. There we sat for a while overlooking the wood, which covered the rest of the estate. Even now the blaze of the sun near it was settling. It seemed to be in the shadow, though the rest was of the view. It should have passed in sight of brilliance. Not the spouts blacked out of the sky, and level rays of beverage as well, the crimson splendour. But the wood was grey and darkening. He also and I were... I was aware, I'd been looking at it, and now they were breaking a disagreeable topic. He turned to me. Tell me, he said, does anything strike you about the wood? That wood? Yes, it seems to lie in the shadow. He found. But it can't, you know, you. You know, he said, where does the shadow come from? Not from inside, outside the sky, the land, or on fire. From inside, then, I asked you there. He was silent a moment. There's something queer about it, he said at length. There's something there I don't know what it is. Daisy feels it too. She doesn't ever go into the wood. It appears the birds don't either. It's just the fact of some explained reason. There's no birds in that has set all your nominations at work. I jumped up. Oh, it's all rubbish, I said. Let's go for it now. I find a bird. I bet you I'll find a bird. Sixpence for every bird you see, said you. We down down the hillside, walked around the wood till we came to the gate. I entered that afternoon, held it after I had gone in for the dogs to follow. But there they stood a yard or so away, and none of them moved. Come on, dogs, I said, and Fiji the doctor came a step nearer, then with a little wine, we treated again. They always do that, Super you. Not one of them will set a foot inside the wood. Look, you were so called a cajoled and scolded, but no use. The dogs remained a little potted grins, and siblings of tails were quite determined not to come. But why, I asked. Some reason that's a same reason the birds, I suppose. Whatever happens to be there, be, to be. There's Fiji, for instance, the sweet, distempered little gay, little lady. Once I had tried to pick her up and carry her in, she said to me, "There's nothing to do with the wood. They trot it round outside it and go home." We left there, there, and then the sunlight lights, and then we began to fade, but by again the passage, uses a sense of airiness and disappears, it's one as a companion, but it's now to me, even with you walking by my side, the place seemed even more cunning they had done that afternoon, the sense of an enjoyable uneasiness, a clue, sort of waking with nightmare, assessed me, I thought before the sciences of loneliness, it played tricks on my nerves, but with but with you here, it could not be that, neither. Indeed, I felt it was not such a notion. I lay the roof at that this fear, but rather conviction that some presence lurking there, invisible yet, yet, with permutating the glory to go a gloom. I could not form the slightest idea of what it might be, or whether it was material or ghostly. All I could do knows of it, from my own sensations, was it was evil and antique. We came into the open ground in the middle of the woods. Hugh stopped and know the evening was cool. I noticed he mopped his forehead. Pretty nice, he said. No, matter, no wonder dogs didn't like, don't like it. How do you, how do you feel about it? Before I could honestly shot his hand, played about the trees that lay beyond. What's that? He said in a whisper. I followed his finger, and one half second thought, I saw against the black of the wood, some vague flicker, grey and faintly luminous. It waved as if it had been red, bent the head and the forepart of some huge snake, rearing itself and instantly disappeared in my glance. And so much I could not trust my impression. It's gone, said Hugh. 
still looking in the direction he pointed. As he stood there, I heard him again. He and I had heard that afternoon a rustle by the far among the fallen beech trees. But there was no wind, no breath, or breath, or breeze a stir. It turned, he turned to me. What on earth was it? he said. It looked like some enormous slug standing up. Did you see it? I'm not sure whether I did or not, I said. I think I just caught a sight of what you saw. What was it, he said. Was it a real material creature, or was it something ghostly, do you mean, I asked. Something halfway between the two, he said. I'll tell you what I mean afterwards, when we get out of this place. The thing, whatever it was, had vanished among the trees to the left of where the one our path lay. In the silence we walked across the open till we came to where I entered the tunnel, like from among the trees. Frankly, I hated the fear, the thoughts of plunging into the darkness with the knowledge of what that, not so far off, there was something in nature for which I could not ever so faintly conjecture, but which I may now may nay, no doubt was which filled the wood with some name terror. Was it material? Was it ghostly? Or was it... There's some inkling of what you might begin to form itself in my mind. Some being that lay in the borderland between the two. Of all the sorts of possibilities, that appeared the most terrifying. We entered the trees again and received a reek alive and cor- yet corrupt. There I, s- I have smelt the floor. But now it's far more potent. We carried, hurried on, choking with the, with the odour. I guessed to be out, not the pungence of decay, the living substance which crawled and reared itself in the darkness, the wood, where no bird would shelter. Somewhere among these trees, not the Republican being a thing that defied a yet compelled credence. It is a blessed relief to let out that dim trouble and hold some air open, a clear light of evening, with doors where we returned, windows were curtained and lamps lit. There was a hint of frost and hue, put a match in a fire in his room, where the dogs, still a little apologetic, held us with trumpings of drowsy tales. And, we, and now we've got to talk, said he, and lay our plans, and for whatever it is that is in the wood, we we'll have to make an end of it. I will, and if you want to know what I think it is, I'll tell you. Go ahead, I said. You may laugh at me, if you like, he said, but I believe it's eternal. That's what, that's what I mean when I said a heart being halfway to the material and the ghostly. I never caught a glimpse of it till this afternoon. I I thought there was something horrible there, but now I've seen it. It's like this when the spirit is a sort of thing described, an elemental, a huge first of fate slug is what they tell us of it. What jaw can surround itself with darkness somehow? They are safe within the doors and cheerless fill light. A walk the room is just appeared merely grotesque. One out there in the darkness that uncomfortable wood, something within me had quaked. I was prepared to believe any horror. But now common sense revolted. What do you do you don't mean to tell me you believe in such rubbish, I said. You might as well say it was a unicorn. What is an elemental anyway? Who has ever seen one set of people who listen to rats in the darkness and say they are made by their aunts? What is it then, he asked. I f- should think it chiefly our own nerves, I said. F- I frankly acknowledge that I got the creeps when I went through the, vo- the wood first. I got m- them much worse when I went through it with you. But it's just nerves. We're frightening ourselves and each other. And are the dogs frightening themselves and each other, he asked. And the birds? That was quite, that was rather harder to answer. In fact, I gave up. You continued. Well, just a moment, we suppose it's something else, and not ourselves, frightened us, the dogs and the birds, he said. And we did see something like a huge fluorescent slug. I won't call it an efferental. If you explain, if you object to that, I'll call it it. It's something, another thing, which is this, it. 
Will it explain what's that? I asked. Well, it's supposed to be some incarnation of evil, corporal form of the devil. It's not spiritual, but to material of its extent. Can be seen in bodily form and heard, as you notice, smelt and God forbid, handled. It may be kept alive by management, and knowing perhaps why, every day since I've been here, I found it on the we went up, some half dozen dead rabbits. Stokes and weasel, said I? No, not stokes and weasel. Don't stoke, kill the prey and eat it. The rabbits have not been eaten. They've been drunk. What on earth do you mean, I asked. I said, there some of them. Just a small hole in the throats, and they drain the blood, just skin and bones, a sort of grey mash of fibre, like the fibre of orange which has been sucked. Also, there was a horrible smell lingering on it, on them. There, that, and was a thing you had a glance of, like a stoked weasel? There came a rat of a handle on the door. Not a word to Daisy, said Hugh, as she entered. I heard you come in, she said. Where did you go? Oh, where in the place, I said I. I came back through the wood. It's not just a, not a bird did we see. That's partly accounted for, because it was dark. I saw her eyes such you. We found a communication there. I guess she'd been playing some attack. In some stay, she did not wish her to know that anything was afoot. I was unpopular, he said. Birds won't go there, birds won't go there, Daisy won't go there. I'm bound to say I spare the fins too, share the fins too. But being braved in, in terrors in the dark, I spoke in the spell. Oh, quiet was it, she said. Quiet was a word of threat. The smallest pit could have been heard dropping half a mile off. We walked over our plans the night after she'd gone to bed. Huge story about the such night has been rather horrible. Though there's no certain connection between these empty vines of bird animals that we had seen, there has been seen a certain weirdness about it. But anything, as he pointed out, could feel like they're clearly not about on the dual side. Ghosts did not have dinner. It was a chill. It was vulnerable. Our plan is therefore very simple. We're going to trample through the wood and when one walks up partridges in a field of trinets, we have a shotgun and a supply of cartridges. I've got to say I look forward to the expedition. I hated the thought of getting into the close quarters, mysterious dead in the forwards. But there's a certain excitement about it, something to keep me awake for a long time. When I got to sleep, the calls very vivid and awful days. <clears throat> the morning failed to fulfill the promise of the clear sunset. The sky was lowering of cloudy rain, fine rain was falling. Daisy had shopping errands which took her into a little town. As soon as she set off, she restarted our business. A red retriever, man with joy, a sight of guns, came bounding with us across the garden. But on and on, entering the woods, she slunk back home again. The woods was roughly circular in shape, with the man to press half a mile in the centre. As I said, there was an open clearing about a quarter of a mile across. There was us surrounded by a belt of thick trees and corpse a couple of hundred yards in breadth. Well, our plan was to meet first a vehicle together on a path which led through the wood with all possible stealth, hoping to hear some movement on the part of what we had come to seek. Falling, failing that, we settled to tramp through a wood at a distance of some 50 yards from each other in a central track. Two or three of these circuits will cover the whole ground pretty thoroughly. Other than each of our quarry, wherever it will be, would try to steal away from us or pleasantly possibly attack. We had no idea it seemed, however, yesterday to have avoided us. Rain had been falling steadily for an hour. When he entered the wood, we hissed. He hissed a little with the treetops overhead. But so thick was the cover of the ground before below was still not more than damp. It's more than dark morning outside. You would have say the sun where he sat the night was falling. Very quietly we moved to the up and gone rosy path. There our footpoles were noiseless. And once we caught a whiff of that odour, with I crashed, but further we strayed and slicened.
not to sound of anything stirred, and set up some of the rain, or the heads. We went across the clearing and through to the far gate, and still with no sign. We're getting into the trees, then, said you. We had better start where we got that whiff of it. He went back to a place which was, was towards the middle, the company's tree. The other still lingered on the windless air. Go about fifty yards, he said, and we're going in. Either of us comes up the track of it, we shout for each other. I walked on down the path till we'd gone by distance signal to him, and he stepped in among the trees. I never known a sensation out of loneliness. I knew that Hugh were walking parallel on me, only fifty years away, but I hung on my step. I could hear faintly clear ear his tread along the breech leaves. I felt as though I was quite sudden in this dim place from all the companionship of man. The only living thing that lured there was monstrous mistress creature of evil. So thick were the trees, I could not make not see more than a dozen yards in any direction. All the places outside the wood seemed indefinitely remote, infinitely removed. And everything that occurred to me in normal human life, I have been whisked out of a wholesome experience in this antique and evil place. The rain has ceased to whisper no longer at the treetops of testifying. It did not exist the world. The sky outside, only a few drops from above so I've uh, patted on beech leaves. Suddenly heard a report of Hugh's gun, followed by his shouting voice. I missed it, he shouted. It's coming in your direction. I found him running towards me. A beech tree is rustling, and no doubt his footsteps drowned a still fear of noise that was close to me. All that happened now, until once more I heard a report of Hugh's gun, happened, I suppose, in less than a minute. If I had not taken longer, I do not imagine I should be telling it today. I stood there having heard you shot, a gun caught and ready to put my shoulder. I listened to his running footsteps, but still I saw nothing to shoot at, I heard nothing. There were tainted beaches quite close to me. I sat and I could only describe a spark ball of darkness. If old any shifted toward me, over a few yards it separated me from it. Then, too late, I heard the dead beech leaves rustling below. Just before it reached me, my brain realized you know, what it was, or might be, but I thought I could raise my gun to, make, to shoot it was to shoot at that knuckle fence. It was upon me. My gun was pitched out of my hand. It was devoted in its darkness, which is the very essence of corruption. It had locked me off my feet, a small flat on my back, upon me. As I lay there, I felt the weight of this invisible assault. I groped wildly in my hands, then clutched something cold and slimy and airy, and slipped it off. The next moment there was laid across my shoulder, and next something felt like an Indian rubber tube. The end of it fastened on my neck, like a snake. I felt the skin writhe beneath it. Again, with clutching hands, I tried to tear the stream, seeing strength away from me. As I struggled with it, I heard Stella's footsteps close to me, through this layer of darkness, I hid everything. His mouth was free, I, and I shouted to him, Hey, here, are you close to you? Where it is, is it, it is darkness. I felt his hands on mine, and it added strength to touch my neck and sucker that pulled at it. A crow lay heavy on my knees and chest rose and struggled to relax. Whatever it was, the little four hands held slipped out of them. I saw Hugo, Hugh standing close to me. A yard or two off, vanishing through the deep red huts, with a blackness that had poured over me, Hugh pulled up his gun, and with his second barrel fired at it. The darkness dispersed, and I was out there wiggling and twisting like a blue worm. Lay what was to come to find. We had to come to find. It was a still. It was lying still. I picked up my gun, which lay in my side, and I fired two more barrels into it. The wind dwindled into mere shudderings and shakings. Then I lay. It lay still.
With a huge help, I lay, got on my feet. We both reloaded before going nearer. On the ground is a there lay a mattress thing, half stuck, half worm. You know, head to it, it ended in blunt point with rough of wrists. It colour is grey, covered with spouts, black and hairs. At length, I suppose it's some four feet, its thickness and broadest part. Was that a man's thigh, taping towards every end? It was shattered by shot at its middle. There's a strain pellets which hit it elsewhere. From the holes I made they ooze, not blood, but some grey, voracious manner. As he stood there, some swift progress of discretion. The cave began. I lost out down. It melted. It liquefied. In a moment more, we were looking at a mass of stained and contradicted beach leaves. Again, quickly, liquor corrupted, faded. Corruption faded. And there lay at our feet a trace of what had been there. The overpowering odour passed away. There came from the, um, above the ground just a sweet savour of wet earth in springtime. I found a glint of sunbeam piercing in the clouds. There was a pattering among the dead. These sent out any heart been all in your mouth again. I cut my gun. It was only his yellow receiver who had jumped had joined us. We looked at each other. You're not hurt, he said. I held up my chin. I held my chin up. Not a bit, I said. Skin's not broken, is it? No, only a red mark. My God, what's that? What was it? What happened? Your turn first, I said I. Begin at the beginning. I came upon this sudden... Upon it quite suddenly, he said. You're lying cold like a sleeping dog behind a dog big beach. Before I could fire, it slipped off in the direction where I knew you were. I got a snapshot at it among the trees. I must have missed it. For I heard the rushing and getting away. I said, you ran, I ran after it. There was a circle of absolute darkness on the ground. The voice came from the middle of it. I couldn't see you at all. At all. I clenched at the darkness, and my hands met yours. And we met, they met someone else too. We got back to the house, put the guns away from Daisy. Before Daisy came home from the shopping, we, just, we also scrubbed a brush to wash. She came into the smoking room. You lazy know, folks, she said, it's clearing up. Why are you still indoors? Let's go uh, out at once. I got up. Hugh has told me you've got a dislike for the wood, I, I said. It's a lonely wood. Come and see. He and I will walk on each other of you and hold your hands. Dogs shall protect you as well. Not, but no, not one of them will go yard in the woods, said she. Oh, yes, they will. At least they would try. You must promise to come if they do. We have so whistled them up. He down he went to the gate. He sat panting for a bit to open. I scolded in the kitchen into the figures and pursued of interesting smells. And who says there are no birds in it, said Daisy. Look, at the robin. Why, there are two of them. Evidently, house hunting.